Hello and welcome to a new series. This is a new series where I'll go over famous investors' books they've written and turn it into main learning points with easy to follow slides and lessons. Our first episode is Benjamin Graham's Investing Style, Finding Discounts and Value in the Markets. Part one of our multi-part series, General Advice. For the video, make sure to like the video and subscribe and hit the bell so that you can get constant notifications of when the next episode in the series gets posted. And since this is a longer video, I decided to make an organization table where we can go over the different topics that will be in this video with timestamps on where to find them. The first of Graham's general topics is on the defensive versus enterprising investor. And your picks later on will be greatly influenced based on the category you fall into. The defensive investor will look something like this, whereas the enterprising investor will look a little bit more like this. Graham prefers if most people would follow this route of the defensive investor. These are people who aren't spending a lot of time with investing. There's 24 hours in the day, and if eight of those hours are sleeping, eight of those hours are working, there's only eight hours left over after each working day. So you take into account that most people have families, hobbies, responsibilities, or work more hours, and that's not much time left to research. And as such, they are encouraged to focus on picking investments primarily based on long-term safety and follow strict rules. Whereas the enterprising investor Graham only recommends this to people who are willing to put a lot of time into taking investing seriously. These are people where they devote a large portion of their life and learning into researching investments, where investing is their hobby or passion. They are finding lesser known companies and the market is overlooking them, giving potential bargain opportunities. The second of his topics is on investment versus speculation. And this is the most important topic across all of his books. And I say that because he has mentioned this in every single book that he's written, which I've read. The difference between the two is simple. One promises the safety of capital and gives adequate returns. And that, of course, would be the investment. And one doesn't have safety of capital, but can give great returns. And that would be speculation. The key for investing with Graham style is being able to identify what's safe and follow those rules. But being new means not really knowing what is and isn't safe. Let's get into some general advice he provides and give more detailed picks for later in other series in the future. Some people think there is no difference between investments and speculation. Because the future is uncertain, they then say that all investments are speculation. And Benjamin Graham finds this line of thinking harmful. This causes problems for two reasons. One, either this then makes people think that hazardous and exciting stocks are synonymous with stable and low risk stocks, or two, it makes people too weary to invest at all. Here are some general pieces of advice from Graham to attain safety of capital in your portfolio. The first of which is to have diversification in your investments. And that means having a mix of different securities and having a mix of different industries. Second of which is to obtain a fundamental analysis of companies in which you invest. And this will be explained later in future videos in the series. And three is to look for reasonable and adequate gains, not extraordinary ones, because consistently gaining money is greater than sometimes getting tons of money and losing it all later. Now we can get into Mr. Market and market fluctuations. You might be wondering who is Mr. Market? He's a personification of the stock market as a whole, and he's a very peculiar salesman who doesn't really know what his goods are worth. What's the purpose of this personification of the stock market? It's to better explain why there is volatility in the markets, and also to understand that price does not equal value. Graham is trying to make the stock market seem less abstract. And so you might ask, can you give an example of what this is like? And I can give something somewhat close, and I'll try to personify Mr. Market as a strange car salesman later on. Mr. Market is all about market fluctuations. So how can you make money with market fluctuations? The first of which is timing the market. And the second is pricing the market. So the first of which, timing the market, that's when you're buying when the market as a whole is really low and selling when it's really high. As for pricing the market, this is determining the value of an asset and buying when it's lower than your estimate. Let's go further into timing the market. Why isn't everyone doing this? Buying low and selling high seems very easy to understand. Timing the market is based on speculative elements which can't be predicted accurately. Experts are wrong most of the time. 
and using speculation will lead to horrible returns in most scenarios, but you could technically get lucky. And as such, to show this example, let's play a simple game in the next few slides. This will be our timing the market game. You only have $10,000 to start with and can't make any more unless you sell what you previously bought. And each year you can buy or sell any number of stocks you want with whatever amount of cash you have. There's no commission on trades and there's 15 trades you can make to rack up as much money as you can. You're assuming you don't know the value of the company and you're buying and selling based purely on the prices you saw in the past. I'll show an example of how this works in the next slide. If you want to play along, pause the video after each year and keep track of your numbers. If you don't want to play, then just skip ahead to the time listed below. Here will be the example. I'll start with $10,000. The year one offer is $100, so I decide to buy 50 shares. I now have 50 shares and $5,000 in cash. Year two, it goes down $20, so I decide to purchase 30 more shares. So buying 30 more means it's 30 times the 80 price, so we subtract that from the $5,000 in cash, and I'm left with $2,600. And this goes on and on, year three, four, five, six, seven, and it sounds simple to do. So just get a calculator and a pencil, or just use Microsoft Word and Excel, and let's have you play for 15 years. Now it'll be your turn for the timing the market game. As mentioned before, you'll have $10,000 to start with. You can buy or sell any number of shares you want, all for no commission. I recommend pausing the video between each year because each year I will only give three seconds before moving on. Anyways, the first year, the offer will be a very basic $100 per share. The second year offer goes up by $5 to $105 per share. Year three will be $120 per share. Year four goes up again to $130 per share. Year five, it goes down to $120 per share. Year six, it goes down again to $115 per share. Year seven, it goes up to $130 per share. Year eight, it goes down to $90 per share. Year nine, it goes down again to $70 per share. Year 10, it goes down again to $50 per share. Year 11, it goes down again to $40 per share. Year 12, it goes up to $60 per share. Year 13, it goes up again to $85 per share. Year 14, it goes up again to $90 per share. And lastly, year 15, it goes down to $85 per share. And now let's get into the results. If you played, I'd love to hear your results in the comments section below. I set up the game to start as a bullish market and end in a recovering crash. Optimally, you should have bought everything as it was going up and sold before each time it was going down in which case you would buy low and sell high. You can see the bottom right box for more details. Starting with our $10,000 and following the same offers that I gave to you, that means optimally making $27,540 in the end. So how close to that number did you get? If it wasn't obvious in the previous examples, Benjamin Graham is not a fan of timing the markets. He feels that it's a total waste of time and effort and it's totally based on speculative elements. Instead, he prefers pricing the market, in which you're buying based on your own evaluation. And Mr. Market's salesman qualities is how we're gonna explain this. Mr. Market is persistent. He makes me an offer every single day. He also doesn't care if I keep turning him down because I'm not forced to buy anything and he doesn't really care if I do or do not buy. Another quality of him is that he's clueless. He doesn't know what his products are worth. He increases and decreases the prices based on what people bought or sold recently. 
My qualities as a rent-a-car business owner. I am knowledgeable about cars and I know how much they're worth. I'm also frugal. I like buying quality products at a discount. As for my business, these are the criteria that I'm looking for in my rent-a-car business. The first of which is safety of the vehicle, the miles per gallon, the extra features in the vehicle, and the space being offered. Cars that are trying to be sold to me and my evaluations of them are listed below. In which case, my 2018 Ford Fiesta, I feel a fair evaluation at the time being $14,200. The Chevrolet Sonic, the evaluation I'm giving at the time was $15,300. And the Nissan Versa, the evaluation I'm giving at the time, $12,000 for fair prices. Not what I want to buy them for, but fair prices. Let's get into our Mr. Market scenario, day number one. He is the salesman and he's trying to give us sales for all of these vehicles for our rent-a-car business. But since it's day one and he doesn't know what anything's worth, he decided just to price everything at $30,000. So it's $30,000 for our Ford Fiesta, Chevrolet Sonic, and Nissan Versa. As we can see, all of these are way above our target marks for a fair price. So we're just gonna ignore his prices and say no thanks and hope that a better deal will come tomorrow. Day two comes around and we are correct. We do get better prices waiting instead of buying from yesterday. Now the Ford Fiesta is being listed at 22,000, Chevrolet Sonic at 19,000 and the Nissan Versa for 15,000. As we can still see, all of these numbers are way above our fair evaluation price. So once again, just like day one, we're just going to ignore Mr. Market, say no thanks, and hope that tomorrow a better deal will be available to us. Day three comes and we might be confused because all the prices went up. This might be because of the sudden drop in all the prices making people wanna buy from yesterday. We look at our evaluation and see this is still way too high and decide not to buy any of the cars. Even if the prices go up, it doesn't mean our evaluation goes up to match it. And because of that, we'll continue to wait. Day four comes around and we start to catch a break because as we can see in the far right side of the screen, the Nissan Versa is now listed at $6,000. We look at our evaluation of what is fair and it is listed at $12,000. So we might be confused once again. Is this the case that the price is incorrect or is it rather that our evaluation is incorrect? Since we are experienced and know what cars are worth based on our own personal evaluations, we decide that the market is incorrect instead of ourselves. And as such, we decide to buy a lot of Nissan Versa cars. As for the other cars, such as the Chevrolet Sonic, we see that's below our evaluation. However, even though it is below our fair value evaluation, it's not that low compared to the Nissan Versa. And we prefer buying things on discounts so that we can have higher returns in the future. And as such, we decide to only buy the Nissan Versa cars. Day five hits, and that means it's the last day in the stock market. We have our 2018 Nissan Versa going back closer to its fair valuation mark. And we see now it is instead the Ford Fiesta car, which is far below our fair valuation price. It is below the two thirds mark based on our evaluation. And we decide that is a decent time to be purchasing the Ford Fiesta car. And as such, just like we did on day four, we're going to be purchasing a lot of the Ford Fiesta cars since it is significantly lower than our fair evaluation price. Once again, the Chevrolet Sonic is not below a significant portion of our evaluation, so we decide to leave that alone entirely, just like we have every other day in the week as well. So did I have any idea what the price would be the next day? There's no way I could even guess that. Sometimes prices went up even when they were already above what I considered a fair evaluation, and price drops seemed to come out of nowhere. But did I know when a decent time to buy was? And that is a yes. My personal evaluation was always the same number, no matter what was happening outside of that. And we can choose to hold long-term or sell accordingly based on our fair evaluation price. I recognize that choosing cars and using Mr. Market as a car salesman is a much more simplified version than the stock market as a whole, but this was just a very easy personification to help explain that the market prices are not rational and that you shouldn't be using timing the market to make money. You should be using pricing the market to make money instead. 
As a quick break, if you have been enjoying the episode and would like to give monthly donations to help support me in making more of these videos in the future, that would be greatly appreciated. The link can be found in the description down below. Graham's comments on inflation throughout his books was limited. He doesn't have much opinion towards inflation in general. This is mostly general information on inflation and how it affects different types of investments. On average, he says inflation grows about 2.5% every year. How big of a deal is this percentage? This percentage changes our buying power over time. And what do I mean by buying power? It's the amount of things I could have bought relative to what I could buy now. So here we have the backwards flat rate inflation calculator, which calculates the equivalent purchasing power of an amount some years ago based on a certain average inflation rate. So we have $1,000 with the average inflation rate of 2.5%. So over 25 years ago, $539.39 would be equivalent to $1,000 now. What are things that are good with inflation? When you are buying a home and getting a loan on a fixed interest. Over time, the amount you owe effectively weakens due to inflation. And what would be bad with inflation? That would be buying a bond. Over time, the amount you would have made dwindles due to inflation. In summation, the good or bad depends on who's collecting when it comes to inflation in general. It's good if it's eating away debts, it's bad if it's eating into profits. And Graham says there is no correlation between stock price and inflation. There's also nothing between earnings and inflation. Inflation still affects stocks because they represent ownership of an operating business, and we will see in what ways shortly. What inflation affects on a company's assets would be things that need replenished, such as foods, building maintenance, and so on. When inflation does not affect on a company's assets, the items that don't need replenished, such as copyrights, branding, and software. And how does it affect the balance sheet? You determine the percentage on the company's assets. Let's say 50% needs replenished and 50% does not for simplicity. Note the average increasing rate of inflation according to Graham is approximately 2.5% each year. So putting it together, and seeing the company's effective buying power over time, let's say a company makes an annual return of 8%. Only 50% of our assets are affected by inflation, so inflation influences us by 1.25% now. Our effective annual return, with inflation accounted for, as a business, is 6.75%. Graham took the history of the market in three sections. One would be the stock prices, two would be the earnings reports, three would be dividends, and Graham had very specific charts and footnotes in all of his books. We'll be looking at the general trends he found. However, if you're interested in seeing the specific charts and footnotes in his books, I do recommend getting them for yourself and reading through them. I do have links for them down in the description below if you are interested. Let's get into the price history. There shows notable patterns with market fluctuations. First is 1900 to 1924, with typical market cycles generally advancing upwards with 3% average growth. Then, from 1924 to 1929, there was extreme speculative growth. Then we had 1929 to 1949, which was deemed the new era of bull market post-crash and had very irregular market fluctuations with about 1.5% average growth. And in 1949 to 1968, the running bull market, with some recessions in 56 to 57 and the 61 to 62, but with a 3.5% average growth. Here are some general statements Graham found in his studies with stock prices. Post-World War II has had superior advances from former decades. And there's always cycles of bias in the market and feelings direction prices. People during his time felt stocks were too speculative to be taken seriously. And it's likely due to the Great Depression. And then there's the earnings report and the dividends. For some more specific data in a time range, he uses data relating to Standard & Poor's composite index at various years. 1948, 1953, 1958, 
1963, 1968, and 1971. This shows average earnings, dividends, and wholesale price going up consistently. And it shows dividend yield, three years earning yields, and stock earnings yields going down consistently. Basically, they were paying more money for less yields of return. But generally speaking, with the stock market history, be speculative during extreme growth periods. Lower your expectations and know that correlation doesn't equal causation. The past events won't point to future results. Then we get into making a portfolio. It is not one size fits all. He doesn't have the perfect portfolio for every single person in the world. Everyone's portfolio should have different characteristics. Ultimately, the portfolio should be representative of your risk tolerance. Are you young or old? Can you wait an extra 10 years if a recession hits stocks when you're close to retirement? Do people depend on you financially, such as children, non-working spouse, or aging parents who are not financially set to retire properly? If you or someone you care about depends on these investments, your portfolio should reflect that. Graham has a recommendation for portfolios, and this is to keep a maximum split between stocks and bonds at 75-25. Be more weighted in stocks if you're able to have a higher tolerance for risk and start shifting to a higher weight in bonds as time goes on in your life. He suggests this due to human psychology. It's because people like to invest when things are looking good and all the prices are moving up. And people are scared when things are looking bad and they want to sell before it gets even worse. The split will help keep the psychology of asset allocation out of this. Let's take $10,000 in stocks and $10,000 in bonds for our first year. Currently, we have a 50-50 split in our allocation. After one year, our investment is $11,000 in stocks, $10,500 in bonds, and we've managed to accrue $500 in cash from our investments. Cash would go towards bonds to make both $11,000. Then we get into the next year. We notice that the stocks have gone down to $9,000 in value, and we have $11,000 in bonds, and once again, $500 in cash from investments. $500 into stocks from cash, and $750 in bonds is sold to buy the stocks, thus leaving $10,250 in both after the money movement. We would have lost more if we put all our money into stocks, and this would go on and on every year until retirement, which leads to much more consistent gains. Typically, this is for when your portfolio is starting to get much larger, but doing it while it's small isn't a bad choice either. Cash will go into stocks during corrections, recessions, or depressions, and cash will go out of stocks during big bull upswings. This section will be on investment funds, and since this is just general information that you can find on the internet by yourself, we're gonna go through these all pretty quickly. Before starting, there are three general questions to ask yourself. One is, do you have a reasonable amount of confidence that you can outperform the market by yourself? And if yes, then investment funds are not for you. If the answer is no, then how can you avoid funds that will do worse than the market? And three, can you make intelligent choices between all the different types of funds available to you? There are plenty of choices and we'll go through them all pretty quickly. The characteristics include the closed versus open funds, passive versus active funds, and broad versus narrow funds. As far as the options, we have mutual funds, hedge funds, exchange traded funds, and index funds. Part one of our characteristics will be on closed versus open funds. For closed, the total number of shares are predetermined. You can't sell shares back to fund managers. They must be sold to other investors. For open, fund managers can buy shares back from investors and they can also create additional shares to sell to existing investors. Part two of our characteristics is passive versus active funds. As far as passive funds, these are typically just them following an index. For active funds, they are consistently managed by a fund manager or a team of fund managers, and they're exchanging their skills for a larger percentage of fees. You should be extremely cautious with these active funds because after fees are accounted for, very few actually beat the market. Part three of our characteristics is broad versus narrow funds. For broad, it is a large range of securities, often in multiple industries. 
It instantly gives a diversified portion for a portfolio. For narrow, it's sometimes called sector funds, and it focuses on a particular field, energy, technology, insurance, and so on. Now we can get into the options. And first thing we're gonna talk about is the mutual funds. Some of the advantages with mutual funds is that it's fast diversification, it's very easy to use, and it's individually tailored to your goals and risk tolerance. However, the disadvantages, the most common one is the cost. You pay money even when they lose your money, and a large percentage is taken out when you're doing well. And not all managers are highly skilled with multiple years of experience. You really need to scope out who is holding your money and if you want to use them as the vehicle for your money instead of other options. The next is the hedge funds. Some of the advantages is potentially incredible returns and hands-off investing. However, the disadvantages include gigantic fees. These are experts who are making a lot of risky moves and they're open only to a select few wealthy people. And these are people who have exceptional income. And this is because they can handle the risk of possibly losing large sums of money. And it is not liquid. Many require you to hold money there for at least one year. The third option is ETFs, exchange traded funds. The advantages with ETFs is that they can be actively traded on the markets. And typically they have low fees. And they give fast diversification in an industry. However, the disadvantages is that some can be heavily leveraged especially ones in hot new industries. You'll be buying the big losers as well as the big winners. Finally, part four, we have index funds. As far as advantages, the fees are extremely low. There's fast diversification over a whole index. And the disadvantages is that there's no possibility to beat the market because you are investing in the whole market. And it's often low flexibility. It can't buy exciting deals because everything is being lumped in together instead of individually looking at choices. Now we can get into accountant traps. Sometimes accountants can flub the numbers so they don't look so bad when people are just looking at things on a glance. The case study for this will be Alcoa in 1970. The share earnings A. In 1970, they reported $5.20. As far as 1969, they had $5.58. You might ask, what is that little A doing there? That represents primary earnings before they take off special charges. This footnote gives information later in the report regarding the special charges. Looking at this, the share earnings have gone down a little bit this year. And perhaps this would be understandable because there was a recession year for aluminum. Perhaps. Now we'll start taking a look at the special charges and the account traps that are there with them. 1969, we have primary earnings and net income after special charges being $5.58. The fully diluted before special charges and after special charges is the same number at $5.35. However, the next year, we decided to include these special charges. Primary earnings, we had $5.20. Then the net income after those special charges, $4.32, which is significantly worse than the $5.58 from last year. We also have the fully diluted before special charges being $5.01 and the fully diluted after special charges being $4.19. Now we can see where these account traps are happening. The account trap is happening with Alcoa in the last quarter. So from before in the 1969 last quarter, we had $1.56. And as we can see in 1970s, this actually went up two cents to $1.58. However, after net income, with the special charges, this is when the drop significantly influenced the amount that they earned that year. From before, they had $1.56, which is the same as the primary earnings. However, in the newest one, we only went down to 70 cents. What are these special charges that we've been talking about so much? They are the estimates for costs of closing down manufactured products division, the estimates for costs of closing down Alcoa Casting Company's plants, the estimates for costs in phasing out Alcoa Credit Company, and the estimates for costs of $5.3 million with a contract ending for their business. Special charges are just a special way of writing out your financial statements, making things not look as bad as they actually are. All these costs were listed as future estimates for costs and losses, and they were completely aware that they were going to happen, and not classified as regular operating results for typical EPS numbers. 
would you have noticed the footnote and kept reading? Because most people just glance at the EPS written towards the top of reports, and most people do not read the bottom half of the reports. The more people trust accountants, the more vulnerable they become. If you've made it all the way through this video so far and you've been enjoying it, leaving a like would be greatly appreciated. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I recommend doing so to stay up to date on this series and other series that I plan on doing in the future. Anyways, let's get into what is the margin of safety for investing purposes. It is to buy below what something's worth. Buying below value means having safety if you're incorrect and huge returns if you are correct. You'll only start buying something between 50 to 67% of the value you feel it's worth. Let's pretend you made a $100 evaluation on a stock and it's being sold currently for $50. If you are correct about your target price, that you feel it's worth $100, over time you are very likely to make solid returns. People will eventually realize the stock is undervalued and you'll double your money. If you are incorrect about your target price, that $100 valuation should have been more like $75. You still make money and that's really important. To not lose money is a key phrase in investing. Next is the what is margin of safety for accounting purposes. And this is from a lecture quote in 1972. The margin of safety is the difference between the percentage rate of the earnings on the stock at the price you pay for it and the rate of the interest on the bonds. And that margin of safety is the difference which would absorb unsatisfactory developments. Benjamin Graham really hated losing money. That's because he was a really good investor. When picking stocks, it's good to have the margin of safety on both ends. Accounting margin of safety, the company end. The investing margin of safety, going from the investor's end. For the company end, do they have a nice cushion if earnings drop for whatever reason? If not, bond payments might require assets from the company to be sold to meet demands or to lay off employees. Investing without a margin of safety in the company means possibly huge consequences. As far as the investor end, is your evaluation correct or not? If you used a margin of safety, then yes, you get huge returns. No, then smaller returns or less damaging losses. Low risk with possibly high returns is what you should be shooting for. Finally, we can get into the limitations of security analysis, what we can possibly account for. And as far as what is security analysis, the definition given by Graham is the careful study of available facts with the attempt to draw conclusions therefrom based on established principles and sound logic. Graham mentioned that security analysis is much like a science as it is an art, similar to cooking. Sure, there are rules that people can read and follow, but having a combination of knowledge, skill, and a little bit of luck is what will really pull you through with your investments over the years. So this is a little bit similar to this. There are three functions for security analysis. The first is descriptive, collecting a large pool of information. Make comparisons to other investments in that field and make a list of strong and weak points, the bull and bear case for whatever you're looking at. Function two is the selective, determining if it's worth buying, selling, or holding the investment in general. There will be more information in the next two slides. Function three will be critical, being aware that numbers could be misrepresented in financial statements, learning from mistakes and avoiding them in the future, and maintaining the safety of your capital. As far as the selective portion of security analysis, value versus price is one of them. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. And it's an estimate of what investment is really worth. The most common evaluation metrics include dividends, assets, and earnings. Then we have being close enough. Being able to roughly know whether an investment is worth buying or not. And we'll get into why in a little bit, but he says, it is quite possible to decide by inspection that a woman is old enough to vote without knowing her age. Just being close enough to know what is this worth is important. Not knowing a very specific dollar amount, it is $1 billion and 21 cents. Continuing on with the selection portion, we mentioned before that being close enough is good enough. That might be a little confusing to people because they want very specific numbers when they're doing security analysis. However, intrinsic value is flexible. The range of approximate value 
grows with the increasing range of uncertainties for that security. Some securities might be estimated anywhere from $20 to $40 or $20 to $100. This is because you're accounting for the good and bad futures. A high spread means a lot of uncertainty. Then we have working with guarantees. There are rare circumstances with price mismatches, especially today. However, he mentioned in some of his books that operations known as arbitrage or hedging are probably the most satisfactory field of work. And Benjamin Graham made lots of money with arbitrage back in his day, where you can exchange one thing for another immediately to make profit. Now we'll be getting into the limitations of security analysis, the limitations of your success that are beyond your control, and the first of which is inadequate or incorrect data being given. Quite simply, the records are not being given to you straight. There are uncertainties of the future also, where making predictions in general is quite difficult. Companies which are able to show stability reduce risk from the uncertainties. Then we have irrational behavior in the market. The only time an analyst should care about the stock's price is when it's abnormally high or low compared to their fair evaluation. Being high means potentially selling and making profit then, and being low means potentially buying and getting an opportunity then as well. And also know that it might take a while. Even if you do find a great purchase, it might take a while for the security to reach its intrinsic value that you set. Securities can go in and out of fashion for long periods of time despite their true worth. Don't think you made a bad choice because it didn't recover within a month or year of the purchase. Also, if you are waiting years for the price to hit your previous evaluations, make sure to redo the analysis. Waiting long periods of time can make the evaluation you gave previously not match with the current evaluation of what the security should have currently. We also have intrinsic value to market price, and below we have a nice quote from Benjamin Graham where in the short term, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. The market is just a voting machine where everybody is putting in their opinions. They also might be looking at the security differently from what you are. Perhaps they are looking at the security in the short term while you want to hold on to it forever. Don't ever take the price of the stock into your evaluations, only look at it afterwards for a potential buy or sell opportunity. As mentioned before, analysis is less effective as uncertainty increases. Remember when Graham said your fair value evaluation has a spread based on good and bad outcomes? Very simply, the less information or certainty that a security has, the less effective analysis will be. Being very good at security analysis will make your chance of solid returns good, but not guaranteed. This is all the more true when looking at speculative securities. Now we get into the age-old question of should I buy, sell, or hold this, and that depends on four key elements. The first is the security itself, and we'll have much more information in the next few slides. Second is the price. You always want to be buying on a discount. Buy $10 bills for $5 and repeat the process over and over. Three is the time you're looking at. The time at which you want to analyze the security might over or under represent the true future outlook. Perhaps a certain sector is only doing well because of a recent trend and perhaps there will be a major shift in interest rates that people can't account for. The fourth one is yourself. How well can you handle losses emotionally? And how old are you? What is your tax status? How experienced are you with investing? Looking at the security itself, we'll go into the negative things for the security. First of which is the provisions of the issue. The example we can given is the preferred stock with a lot of debt attached that is not qualified for dividends or principal payment. What it means is that it lacks the safety of the bond while also giving bad returns compared to common stock. Second is the status of the issue. Let's say that it doesn't have reserve funds to fall back on during hard times, making it need to take on debt if anything went wrong. Third is the price of the issue. Do securities with higher priority, such as bonds or preferred stock, have higher yields? If the yields are better than the dividends being paid from the stock, why buy it? Let's also go into growth stocks and ones that don't pay dividends. Is the growth of the earnings justifiable to the price being paid? Will that be reflected in the stock price in the future? Do you strongly believe the growth shown will continue for many years, or is this just a trend that will fade out in a few years? Then we have the positive things for the security. Once again, we have the provisions of the issue. The business has companies, cities, or people relying on them with little or no competition. Second is the status of the issue. The business is fully capable of making payments and has an excess of cash to fall back on if something went wrong. 
third is the price of the issue. The security is priced to outperform other options available both in the same business and also relative to the business's competition. When talking about the limitations of security analysis, there are qualitative versus quantitative factors to account for. If we only look at the quantitative factors, you are ignoring the qualitative ones and vice versa, which makes you not get a fully representative idea of how good the business is. So we'll have the quantitative methods over on the left side. We see that only one in 30 take the free ice cream, which he finds interesting. However, you might get that number and not understand why so few people are taking the ice cream. So to get a qualitative method would be to understand why things are happening in the quantitative method. So he asked the question, what do you feel when you saw the free ice cream? And the person who took it said, excited, a little scared, and he'll continue into that. And why was that? So then with these qualitative methods, they can take that and potentially change something so that the quantitative methods can be applied and make more money in the future. But in this case, it's to get more people to get the free ice cream from the cart. So that was just very generally saying what qualitative versus quantitative is. Let's put it to how it relates to investing. For quantitative, it's defined numbers that can be found in the balance sheet or income statement. For qualitative, it is characteristics of the business that give it an edge. So let's go into, is this quantitative or qualitative? Management skill would be qualitative. Although not directly on the balance sheet, this is a big deal in evaluation. Then we have earnings growth, quantitative one of the most important metrics in evaluation. Then being the biggest business in that sector, that would be qualitative. Having the largest market share could be a qualitative boost if managed properly. Then we have dividend payout ratio, which would be quantitative. I like dividends, but I would like to know it's not stopping the business from growing, which is an important factor in evaluation. Now we'll get into one of the age old questions. Should I use past performance to predict future results? Using the past for the future should only be a very rough estimate for a few businesses only. And because of this, Benjamin Graham and David Dodd consider this a qualitative form of analysis. If a 10 year average gave you a yearly growth of 12%, then don't say the next year will have 12% growth. This isn't to say it's not important or interesting, but don't use it as a given fact for what will happen. So we'll go into the possibly good and bad predicting future growth using past data. The possibly good would be using it for very old companies with a lot of history and companies with linear growth trends where management is staying the same at the top. Then the probably bad, we have new companies in general, companies with exponential growth trends and trendy sectors with a lot of hype surrounding them. After watching the video, I have the question to you. Do you like Benjamin Graham's style? If you like his style of investing, then get his books from the description down below. Those are the books that I read to make this video. And his books will give diagrams and charts to help you learn. And his writing is very technical and great for learning. Did you learn something new or think about investing in a new way? I would advise you to smash the like button to show that you enjoy these videos. And subscribe and hit the bell if you're new here. These types of videos take a long time to make, so it's greatly appreciated if you would. Thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next episode.